بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عظم الله جورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بسيدنا ومولانا أبي عبد الله الحسين عليه السلام وجعلنا الله وإياكم من الطالبين بثأره بين يدي الإمام المنصور المؤيد المهدي من آل محمد الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد on the dawn of the day of عاشوراء إمام الحسين عليه السلام led his companions in prayer having completed the prayer he then stood up and began to speak to them having thanked Allah and then praised Allah he then said إن الله تعالى أذن في قتلي وقتلكم في هذا اليوم فعليكم بالصبر والقتال His companions numbered between 72 according to certain narrations 77, 82 and some into the early part of 145 and the Imam gave the authority of the right wing of his army to Zuhair ibn al qain the authority of the left wing of his army to Habib ibn Madahir. He gave the banner to his brother Abbas, and he himself took the center of the army to protect his family. Umar bin Sa'ad, approached the army of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with an army of 30,000 soldiers. He gave the authority of the right wing to Amr bin Hajjaj al-Zabidi and the authority of the left wing to Shimr bin al-Joshan. He gave the authority of the foot soldiers to Shabbat bin Rab'i and he gave the authority of the cavaliers to Uzra bin Qais and the banner to Duraid. Upon marching towards the army of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the army of Umar bin Sa'ad saw that a fire had been lit behind the tents. Upon seeing this, Shimr called out, O oh Hussein, are you rushing towards the fire before the day of judgment? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam replied, Is that Shimr? They said to him, Yes. <clears throat> he said, O oh son of the goat herder, you are more worthy of punishment than I am. Muslim bin Awsaja then took an arrow looking to shoot it towards the army of Umar bin Sa'ad to which Imam al-Hussein looked at him and said, 
أَكْرَهُ أَنْ أَبْدَأَهُمْ بِقِتَالِ I do not want to be the one who begins this war. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam at that moment raised his hands in dua and called out, O oh Allah, you are my trust in every calamity and you are my hope in every difficulty and for every matter that falls upon me, you are a trust and a preparer. How many a difficulty in which the kernel of the heart is weakened Opportunities become scarce. Friends let you down and your enemies mock you. Have I complained to you and I leave to you? For I don't seek anyone else besides you. And O oh Allah, you have pushed these away from me. And you are the one who has relieved them. You are the master of every blessing and the final hope of every wish. The first of our loud salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The second even louder salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Respected brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. 12 hours, 5.47 a.m. to 5.47 p.m. Amongst the most important 12 hours in Islamic history. The 12 hours in which we saw the angelic and we saw the demonic. 12 hours in which you see the godly and in which you see the satanic. 12 hours in which you see right versus wrong, good versus evil. And 12 hours which could be celebrated or indeed commemorated when one examines the final 12 hours of the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Indeed, these final 12 hours of the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam are arguably, without a doubt, amongst the most important in Islamic history. But unfortunately, these 12 hours from 5.47 a.m. on the 10th of Muharram until 5.47 p.m. in what is known as Sham al-Gharibana are not examined with the depth that they deserve. If you ask many Muslims in the world to give you an hour-by-hour hour narration of what took place in Karbala on the day of Ashura, You'll see that many Muslims don't even know about what happened to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram. Even if you were to ask the Shia who love Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, they tell me hour by hour what took place in Karbala. What were the sermons of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala? What were the ad'iyah or the supplications of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala? What were the words of the opposition and what were the words of the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala? You'll find that unfortunately many people are not able to break down to you what took place in Karbala. I ask people a simple question. Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi, for example, when did he change his mind and join the army of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Was it on the day of Ashura? If it was on the day of Ashura, was it before Dhuhr or after Dhuhr? I ask others a question that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, who from his family was the first to go out on the battlefield? And when was this? I ask a question that Muslim bin Awsajah died before Habib bin Madahir, but when was this on the day of Ashura? I ask others the question that what of the poems of Ashura have you memorized? If I was to ask you, for example, that the first line of a poem is in Tunkiruni, فَأَنَ أَبْنُ الْكَلْبِ Who is Ibn al-Kalbi? And who is this person and his poem? Who is it on the day of Ashura who said, أَذُودُكُمْ بِالسَّيْفِ عَنْ حُسَيْنِ كَيْفَ تَرَى الْكُفَّارِ ضَرْبَ الْأَسْوَدِ There are all these lines that are said on the day of Ashura, which are not just poems from Ashab al-Husayn alayhi salam, but they are the very meaning of aqeedah, the very meaning of iman, the meaning of taqwa, the meaning of sabr. 
Normally, what happened on the day of Ashura is narrated in the form of Masa'ib in different cultures. What do I mean? In the Indo-Pak subcontinent, on the day of Ashura, you'll see that the majority of the Majalis may, for example, look at the A'mal of Ashura. If you ask people, what are the A'mal of Ashura? They'll give you the Ad'iya of what are the supplications to be recited on Ashura. However, you'll see that their Masa'ib that they hear, or the Na'i that they hear, or the Musiba that they hear in the Indo-Pak subcontinent, is normally only that related to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So for example, if you go to parts of India or parts of Pakistan or even members of the Khaja community, for example, of East Africa, you'll see that in Ashura day, the amount that they will narrate of 12 hours of discussions of back and forth will only be 20 minutes masaib of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. You'll hear a Mawlana go up there. And he'll say the musibah of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and that will be it. Further than that, are there any du'as of Imam al Hussein discussed? Are there any sermons, or the sermons of Zuhair ibn al Qayn, or the sermons of, for example, the others of the companions of Imam al Hussein? You'll see a lot of these are not discussed in the masaib. Even some communities will tell the Mawlana that please, masaib, just 15 20 minutes if you don't mind. Because we have to serve food and we have to pray. Therefore, that whole generation grows up without knowing what exactly took place on Ashura day. In that generation, the mothers, the fathers, the children will not know about the 12 hours of Ashura day except the Masaib. They know Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas died. Ali al-Akbar died. Qasim died. Imam al Hussein died, companions of Imam al Hussein died. But if they all died, you could pretty much kill all of them within one hour. But we know that from 5 47 a.m. until an hour, let's say, or so before Maghrib, for example, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is alive on the 10th of Muharram for 10 hours and more. If he is alive for 10 hours and more, I asked the question, what did he say in those 10 hours? Why is it that in our menhaj of learning, many of us grow up loving Imam al Hussein alayhi salam without being able to narrate one of his sermons on Ashura day? We go through years of majalis without once being able to narrate a single one of the sermons of Imam al Hussein to our children. If now my child is going through a difficult time, Maybe I have a teenage child and I want to tell them about how to remain strong. Imagine I've memorized the dua of Imam al Hussein when he was in a very difficult position. And I tell them that before you go to college or university, recite this dua. But if I don't know the dua and all I'm interested in when I'm listening to a majlis is that Imam al Hussein got killed by so and so on Ashura day, let's all cry then have I really examined Ashura day in depth? In the Arab community, we have what is known as the Maqtal. The Maqtal in the Arab community is recited on Ashura morning. We said that in the Indo-Pak subcontinent, the Masaib is just Imam al Hussein. In the Arab community, however, the whole Maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam from 547 until the time that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is killed, every single back and forth that takes place between the army of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and the army of Umar bin Sa'ad is read by the Mawlana on Ashura day in the morning. How long is it normally the recital of the maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Normally a couple of hours. The Mawlana will sit there in the morning. And he will recite. Now for most of us, the reality is that after about an hour, we're switching off when the Mawlana is going through the whole maqtal. Why? Because the maqtal is a very long back and forth between Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and Sayyidah Zainab, between Imam and Abu al-Fadl, Imam and Ali al-Akbar, Imam and Qasim, Imam and the ladies of his camp, but also Imam and Shimr, Imam and Umar bin Sa'ad. Also, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, and the sermons that they gave. Normally when people recite the Masaib of Hur, no one mentions the sermon of Hur. 
When people recite the Masaib of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, never do they mention the Khutbah of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn on Ashura day. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had companions who on Ashura day came forward and gave lectures to the opposition. Ask many of the Shia who have listened to thousands of majalis. Narrate to me the Khutbah of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. Narrate to me the Khutbah of Hur bin Yazid al-Riyahi. I don't know. Why? So therefore, in the Arab community, what do we have? We have the maqtal, which is a great tick. But the reality of that maqtal is that the maqtal is condensed on the morning of Ashura rather than being examined and broken down for everyone to understand. Some cultures, what did they do to try and understand what took place at Karbala? They tried to, for each night, give a certain section of masaib to one of the companions of Imam al-Hussein Do you agree? Normally what happens is, that people, for example, in some cultures, on the 6th of Muharram, some cultures will remember Ali al-Akbar, Musibah. Some cultures on the 6th of Muharram will remember Awnan, Muhammad's Musibah. Some people, like in Iraq, in the 7th of Muharram, they remember Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas's Musibah. Whereas in the Indo-Pak subcontinent, you'll see people remembering it on the 8th of Muharram. Those were done, why? So that we could have a breakdown understanding what took place. I remember even when I was younger, I actually thought that they died on those days. So I remember when I was younger, I used to listen and I'd be like, yes, Habib al Madahir, for example, 4th of Muharram. And for example, for example, let's say something like um, Muslim bin Awsaja must have died with him on the 4th of Muharram because you normally group all the Ansar together. But then later, as you grow older, you found out that, hold on a minute, they all died on Ashura day. But how many of us are able to recount line by line? So I went about memorizing the maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam this year. Having completed it, a number of years, I have gone over the maqtal, memorized, 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 until, alhamdulillah, I decided that this was the year that I was going to narrate the whole maqtal but in a series of 12 lectures so that we were able to understand what exactly took place on the 10th of Muharram. Who said what? What was the order of what took place on the 10th of Muharram? Now, naturally, when I've memorized this whole maqtal, naturally, there are certain methodological issues that emerge. Can I actually tell you what exactly took place in those 12 hours on the 10th of Muharram? Am I able to tell you exactly who said what? It's pretty impossible 1400 years later for me to tell you that this is exactly what happened on the 10th of Muharram. Why? First and foremost, it's difficult for me to tell you exactly what took place on the 10th of Muharram, because the reality is there's a lot of literature from the early period that is not necessarily with us today, or may not necessarily be with us today in its complete version. Many of the Sunni and the Shia, when they examine the last 12 hours, or what is known as the Maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, you'll find that they all pretty much go back to one main book, and that is the narration of Abu Mekhnaf. Lut bin Yahya. Many of them will go back to Abu Mekhnaf. So whether you're a Sunni alim or you're a Shia alim, you'll go back to Lut bin Yahya, Abu Mekhnaf, and you will go back to an understanding of Maqtal of Ashura day from Abu Mekhnaf. So you'll see, for example, your Tabaris, your Ibn Kathirs, your Baladaris, even your Ibn Sa'ads, Waqidis, and so on, Khalifa bin Khayyat, and you'll go to a lot of these scholars of the other schools in Islam, when they talk about Karbala, a lot of the names I just mentioned will go back to Abu Mekhnaf. Likewise with us, the Shia, a lot of our maqatil literature will seek to go back to taking from original sources, either like Abu Mekhnaf, or, for example, whatever was available to us at the time. When I therefore go about discussing the 12 hours of Ashura day from 5.47 a.m. Fajr until Shama Gharibaan, I am trying to bring together the maqtal. I'm going to use as a Shi'i, I will use Sheikh al-Saduq, and I will use Sheikh al-Mufid, and then I will use other scholars who have discussed the maqtal of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, such as, for example, Ibn Shahar Ashur. 
So I'll use these scholars to look at the maqtal. I'll also use Sunni ulama to look at the maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Because in reality, there is a lot of literature of the maqtal in Sunni world as well. So these names that I mentioned, such as Ibn Sa'ad, such as Baladari, even Bukhari, uh, even the likes of, for example, Khalifa bin Khayyat, Ibn Kathir, all of these have discussed the maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When I look at all of this, I find that they have a lot of things in common with one another, which helps me when I discuss the last 12 hours of the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So for example, if there's a sermon that Imam al Hussein gave on Ashura, I may find it in a Shi'i literature. I may find it where? In Sunni literature as well. But my main sources, first and foremost, would probably be Kitab al-Irshad of Shaykh al-Mufid. I will look at the Amali of Sajuq, the Manaqib of Ibn Shahar Ashub, and then I will look at Sunni literature as well. Can I say that everything that took place in Karbala is with me today? No. Can I say that even some of our personalities who discuss Karbala have maybe exaggerated or made up certain things? Yes. There have even been fabrications related to what happened in Karbala. As in sometimes there are years where newer and newer masaib are introduced, new stories are introduced, and you're looking at it and you're thinking, hold on, I, I've never heard that one before. And where did you get that one from? And the reality is that when a person wants to reconstruct what took place in the last 12 hours of the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the reality is while there is an openness for diversity and difference of opinion, there is definitely a difference between primary sources and secondary sources on this issue. There are certain conclusions in the earliest texts about the last 12 hours of the life of Imam al Hussein that may not be there in, for example, later texts. And there are certain things that are said in the later texts that may not be there in the earlier texts. And we'll go through them, inshallah, in the next 12 nights or so. So therefore, when we're going to look at the next 12 nights, we're going to look at hour by hour what took place on Ashura day. Every khutbah that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam gave, I will give. Every dua he gave, I will recite. Every word that was said by his companions, we will recite. Every word that was said by the opposition, we will seek to understand. Let me give some context before I go into 5.47 a.m. And I'm sure there's some of you thinking, how do you know it was 5.47 a.m.? Let me give some context as to what's exactly happening because we have our non-Muslim viewers who watch these majalis as well. Let's give some context. About six months before Ashura, 10th of Muharram, 61 AH. Six months before, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is living in Medina. While in Medina, everyone focus on this please. While in Medina, uh, years earlier, when Imam al Hassan got killed, some of the Shia said to Imam al Hussein, Why don't you get up and fight against Muawiyah? Imam al Hussein replied simply, he said that I have a treaty and I will continue with the terms of that treaty that was agreed with Imam al Hassan and Muawiyah. When Muawiyah died, what then took place? When Muawiyah died, Yazid came in. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was in Medina. Yazid's governor in Medina, Walid bin Utbah, was ordered by Yazid that he has to get the pledge from Imam al Hussein or Imam al Hussein is to be killed. Imam al Hussein decides at the end of Rajab, Six months before Ashura day that he is going to leave what? He's going to leave Medina with his family. Barring people like Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyyah and his grandmother and a couple of others, the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, they all leave Medina. They head where? They head towards Mecca. When they get to Mecca, Imam al Hussein stays in Mecca for a few months. When he stays in Mecca for a few months, there are different personalities who are around, who are living in Mecca at the time. Your Abdullah ibn Zubairs, your companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, while in Mecca, four messengers come to him from Kufa. These four come to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and they say to him, Ya Ba Abdullah, 
the people of Kufa are ready to have you as their Imam. And we will have all our people ready to support you. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam decides that he's going to send his ambassador, Muslim bin Aqil, to the land of Kufa. Muslim bin Aqil heads towards Kufa. On the way, Muslim bin Aqil loses two people with him. He writes to Imam al Hussein that I think this is a bad omen. Imam al Hussein replies, according to Shaykh al Mufid and the Irshad, that stop being a coward and continue going towards Kufa. Muslim bin Aqil says that I head towards Kufa. He continues towards the land of Kufa. When he goes there at the time, the governor is who? Nu'man bin Bashir, father-in-law of the person Muslim bin Aqil staying in his house, which is who? Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Nu'man bin Bashir is governor of Kufa. Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, Muslim bin Aqil comes and he stays in the house of Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Muslim is welcomed by the people of Kufa. Everybody's coming to him. Thousands are telling him we're with Imam al Hussein. Tell Imam al Hussein to leave Mecca and tell him that we're going to be there waiting for him. Muslim bin Aqil sees all these people. Yazid gets the message from Nu'man bin Bashir that we're in trouble. Muslim bin Aqil is here. Hussein bin Ali is on his way. Yazid turns around. He has a Roman ambassador who's a Christian by the name of Sir John. Sir John al Rumi. He says to him, what do I do? The Christian ambassador of Yazid, Sir John, says to him, you want me to tell you what your dad would have done, Muawiyah? He said, yes. He said, put Ibn Ziyad in charge of Kufa. Ibn Ziyad in his late 20s, maybe early 30s, is in charge of Kufa, in charge of Basra at the time. He leaves Basra to come to Kufa. The people of Kufa who had not seen Imam al-Hussein for a long time see a man who enters, that man they think is Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Ibn Ziyad enters, covered up, he enters Kufa, before you know it, he has a lot of people who are his supporters. The Shia in Kufa were a big number, but they were a minority in comparison to non-Shia. Ibn Ziyad enters Kufa, captures Hani bin Urwa, Muslim bin Aqil, and thousands of others of Shia, and beheads them and kills them in Kunasa Square in Kufa. Ibn Ziyad knows Imam al Hussein is heading from Mecca to where? Where is Imam coming to? Kufa. Ibn Ziyad wants Imam al Hussein blocked on the way to Kufa. He sends Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi to go towards Imam al Hussein. Hur meets Imam al Hussein. When he meets him, he at the beginning makes it clear to him that you cannot go towards Kufa. Imam al Hussein says to him, But I have people who've told me to come. Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi replies, I don't know anything that you're talking about, about people telling you to come. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam turns around and tells Hud that this is exactly what I've been promised. Allow me, therefore, to go towards the land of Kufa. Umar bin Sa'ad comes to Karbala a week before Ashura. Umar bin Sa'ad comes to Karbala to begin negotiations with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He begins to negotiate with Imam al Hussein. Negotiations for what? Imam al Hussein says, Allow me to go towards where? Towards Kufa. Umar bin Sa'ad said, You cannot go towards Kufa. You are not allowed to go. You have to pledge allegiance to Yazid. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam goes back and forth in his discussions with Umar bin Sa'ad when Umar bin Sa'ad has blocked him. Until Imam al Hussein alayhi salam tells Umar bin Sa'ad, Allow me to go home. I have no interest in fighting. I will return back to my house. Sheikh al Mufid says, he said, I will return back to my house, or I'm willing to even discuss with Yazid about reaching a compromise. Umar bin Sa'ad thinks he's got an achievement on the 3rd of Muharram. Umar bin Sa'ad writes to Ibn Ziyad and says to Ibn Ziyad that I have reached a compromise with Hussein. He is ready to return home. And he is ready to have a discussion with Yazid about what's happening. Ibn Ziyad at the beginning says, okay, that is good news. Until Shimr bin Diljoshan turns around and says, do not be weak at this moment. Now that Hussein bin Ali is so close to us, do not allow him to go home. Shimr comes towards Umar bin Sa'ad, makes it clear to Umar bin Sa'ad that either this is done, 
or you are to be removed from your position and I take over your position. Ibn Ziyad tells Umar bin Sa'ad and Shimr, Hussein bin Ali is to die without a drop of water given to him like Uthman was killed. And then he says, kill him if he doesn't pledge allegiance to me. They said to him, but he is ready to talk to Yazid. He said, no, he has to pledge allegiance to me or you kill him and then you make sure that you have your horses trample all over his body. When this occurs, Imam al Hussein continues to tell Umar bin Sa'ad that, oh Umar, do not listen to what this man's saying. Whatever he promises you and whatever Yazid promises you, is not going to come towards you. Where are we now? We are now 9th of Muharram. 9th of Muharram. Uh, the Shimr bin Diljoshan wants to start war. Imam al Hussein asks Abu al Fadl al Abbas, go and speak to them and tell them to try and allow us to have one more night. For you know how much I love the Quran and how much I love dua and you know how much I love the prayer. So he goes towards him says, okay, we give you one more night. We are now coming towards 5.47 a.m. One more night, you're allowed to have. Tomorrow, you either pledge allegiance to Ibn Ziyad or you people will be killed. Imam al Hussein that night turns around to his companions and he says to his companions that use the darkness for you to ride as a camel. Meaning that in the darkness of the night, go home. And suddenly the first to come towards him, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas says, I'm here for you. Then the sons of Aqil, we're here for you. And then you had Muslim in Awsaja, I'm here for you. Zuhair ibn al-Qain, I'm here for you. Imam al Hussein, around a few hours before the beginning of Ashura day, sees his sister Zainab is devastated. So he looks towards his sister Zainab alayhi salam. She says, I lose you having lost my mother and my father and my brother. Zainab alayhi salam begins to hit her face in front of him. He tries to hold her. She then rips her clothes. He tries to hold her and says that maintain your strength. Try and be as strong as you can for there are difficulties to come. Everybody on this night can be seen in their prayers. And now they're in their prayers. 5.47 a.m. Someone says, how do you know 5.47 a.m.? Because Dr. Ahmed Barshak, one of the great Iranian scientists, mathematicians, and a man of calendars, calendarist, he done a research based on the solar calendar of the times of everything that took place on Ashura Day. He said Ashura day Fajr would have been 5.47 a.m. according to the solar calendar. Therefore, this great Iranian scientist who died 20 years ago, he provided with the timings of everything that took place on Ashura day. Because you know, the majority of Shia who listen to Majalis do not know the times of everything that took place on Ashura day. He looked at the solar calendar, which is much more easy to scrutinize than the lunar, and he was able to find the times of what took place. Therefore, at 5.47 a.m. on Ashura day, the maqtal begins of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. How does the maqtal begin? On the dawn of the day of Ashura, the first lesson. Imam al Hussein led his companions in Fajr prayer. First lesson, what is it? The first lesson is that the companions of any imam are not those who would miss their Fajr Salah. One of the most difficult Salahs, no doubt. But you look at the companions of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam, Wallah, on that day you'd be trembling, nervous. You're thinking, you know what, in a few hours I'm going to lose my child, I'm going to lose my family member, I'm going to lose my father. It does not affect them one bit. Hussein bin Ali stands up, Salat Al-Fajr, and they're able to come forward at the front and the adhan is recited. There are two people who recite adhan on the 10th of Muharram. Of them is Ali al-Akbar, alayhi salam. He comes forward. There is a recital of the adhan and they all gather together in Salat al-Fajr. Notice the first point that a Husseini never misses Fajr. The amount of Shia, the amount of Muslims I'm going to say, who don't wake up for Fajr unless they've stayed up late is very sad. 
Today, you'll find people who'll even go to sleep without thinking of waking up for Fajr. Whereas the reality is, if they had a flight at Fajr, they'll never miss it. They'll tell the whole family, wake me up. Whereas, when it comes to Salat al-Fajr on a normal basis, you'll see that there are many who have no interest whatsoever in waking up for Salat al-Fajr. Look at Hussein's companions on the morning of Ashura. Number one. Number two, the second lesson was they prayed in jama'ah, not individual. Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim salam used to love Salat al-Jama'ah. That when we're all together, why can't we pray in jama'ah? Someone says, but no Mawlana is here. Who said the Mawlana has to be there? <clears throat> For what reason? Woman can lead woman in salah. And the men can lead the men in salah. It is embarrassing if there is a situation where amongst us in our communities, you and five, six friends cannot get together and pray Salat al-Jama'ah. No one saying that a person cannot enjoy their day, cannot enjoy their time. But when it's Salah time, number one, they prayed Salah till Fajr. Number two, they prayed it in Jama'ah, not individually. Number three was that they prayed on time. They made sure that that Salah wasn't kept late. The Salah was kept on time. But number four, Umar bin Sa'ad's army also prayed Fajr. Now here we have an issue. Umar bin Sa'ad's army, Salat al-Fajr. Hussein bin Ali's army, Salat al-Fajr. What did it show? Salah without reflection is not like a Salah with reflection. On the one side, you have those who are praying Salah, praising the grandfather of the man who's leading them. On the other side, you have a Salah where the people are praising the grandfather of the man they're about to kill. Sometimes we also go through life where our salah, there's no reflection. Wake up for fajr, I'm just about falling asleep, I just want to come into bed. Or dhuhr and asr, or maghrib and isha, I'm thinking of my meetings and where I'm going out. That salah with no reflection is not like the salah of reflection. Umar bin Sa'ad's army, it just needed a bit of reflection that in my salah I've just praised his granddad. Am I going to kill him in a few hours? That's all it needed. But the lack of reflection means on the day of judgment, that salah, you know what happens to it? It's thrown back to you. Here, take your salah. Take it. Why are you praying to me? You've missed the point of reflection and salah. Notice the Quran doesn't say that Allah praises those who pray. Allah praises those who are what? Who are reflecting in their salah. Who are humble in their salah. Therefore, on the first level, what do we find? We find that both of them prayed, both sides. But Imam al Hussein's side had reflected on the words they say in Salah. Do you know how many Muslims, by the way, when they pray, they don't know the meaning of what they're saying? The meaning of what they're saying, they don't know. If you ask a Muslim to do an exam, any 30 year old, 40 year old, 50 year old, translate for me the words of what you've just read. Translate them, all the Arabic words. One by one, translate them. Many of them will not know how to translate. Why? Because they've never thought of reflecting on the words they're saying. Karbala, Umar bin Sa'ad's army, Salah. Hussein bin Ali's army, Salah. One side, Muslim bin Awsajah, Habib bin Madahir, John, Hud, all of these reflecting on their Salah. The other side had memorized Fatiha, memorized Quran, prayed Salat al-Layl, but there was no reflection whatsoever. When there's no reflection, then that salah does not tenha an al fahsha wal munka. Salah in the Quran, Allah says, in the salah tenha an al fahsha wal munka. Salah was meant to prevent evil and indecency. Subhanallah, Umar bin Sa'ad's army salah brought about the greatest evil in human history. How? Fajr. They're praying Fajr. Salah in the Quran, it said, Tanha an al fahsha'i wal munkar. They did the most munkar on one day in Muharram, true? Therefore, if I don't reflect in my salah, and there are many, wallah, there are many who pray Dhuhr and Asr. I've seen people who pray Dhuhr and Asr who go and gamble in casinos. True? I've seen people pray Dhuhr and Asr who also wouldn't mind smoking or taking that which is haram. But they pray. Why do they end up doing haram? Hence, that person who asked, the Prophet, how do I know if my salah has been accepted? 
He said, look at your behavior from that salah till the next salah. You'll know if the previous one was accepted. If my behavior after that salah is the same as it was before and there's been no change, then that previous salah has not been accepted. Look on there for the Fajr. Umar bin Sa'ad's arm is praying. Imam al Hussein's arm is praying. The second point about their salah was what? The second point about their salah was one salah was prayed behind a divine guide and the other was prayed behind any guide. This salah of Imam al Hussein's army was a salah that had wilayat with it. Whereas that salah did not have the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt with it. Both were praying Fajr. But there is a difference with a salah that is completed with the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt versus a salah that has no wilaya. How many times did Imam Sadiq used to say, if you pray prayers the size of Mount Uhud without recognizing the position of Muhammad and Al Muhammad, your salah is not counting. For what reason? Because here I have a divine guide. When I pray recognizing his position, then I will take the wisdom of this man into my life. There's Umar bin Sa'ad on one side leading Fajr, Hussein bin Ali. Look at the difference in their behaviors on the 10th of Muharram. One is ready to order his army to even ch kill six-month-old babies, for example. Whereas the other one is looking in every which way possible to open the doors of mercy for the opposition. One chosen by Allah, the other chosen by his people. Therefore, on the dawn of the day of Ashura, 5.47 a.m., Imam al Hussein leads his companions in prayer. Then having finished the prayer, what does Imam al Hussein do? He stands up and he gives the khutbah. When he stands up and he gives the khutbah, what does he say? He first thanks Allah and praises him. I ask all of you a question. You're seeing a situation where you're thirsty. Your children are about to get killed. Your family are about to be made captives. Would you thank Allah at that moment? He thanks Allah and he praises Allah. And shows us that in life, subhanallah, there's just a moment of perspective can change your whole outlook and philosophy in a very diff difficult situation. He thanks Allah, he praises Allah, and then he says something which is straight to the point to his companions. Inna Allah ta'ala adhina fi qatli wa qatlikum fi hadha al-yawm. Allah has given permission for me to die and for you to die on this day. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالْقِتَانِ So get ready for patience and for killing and war. Imagine the imam of your time told you this line. Allah has ordained for all of us to die. There's one group of us, wallah, at that moment you ride that horse and you leave Karbala as soon as possible. There's another side of us. Not one of them flinched at all. When Imam al Hussein looked at them and said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ أَذِنَ فِي قَتْلِ Allah has now willed given permission for my death, وَقَتْلِكُمْ فِي هَذَا الْيَوْمِ All of us are going to die today. Are you all okay? One of them smiling, the other's like, I can't wait, I'm going to meet your dad and your granddad very soon. Because when you think about it, if death means I'm going to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa let's die. If death means I'm going to meet Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, what's death then? Because I've been looking forward to meeting him my whole life. Imam al Hussein looks at them. Inna Allah Ta'ala adhina fi qatli wa qatlikum bi adha al-yawm fa'alaykum bil-sabri wal-qital. Then your responsibility is what? To be patient with what you're about to see because the next 12 hours are the most difficult 12 hours in the history of any human beings. You're going to see arrogance, envy, hate, hypocrisy all towards you. But I ask all of you, try and remain patient. For patience is to faith like head is to the body. True? Remain patient, but also get ready for war. There are many who say that we have patience in religion, but they're not cut out to be in the battlefield ready to lose their life for Ahlul Bayt. I have the highest respect for those lovers of Ahlul Bayt who are not just ready to talk the talk, but they're ready to walk the walk. Ashab al Hussein did not just pray salah. They were ready that if they took a bullet, they take a bullet for Imam al Hussein. Did Zuhair ibn al Qayyim not say on the night of Ashura, Wallah, if I got killed and resurrected a thousand times, 
and they hit me a thousand times, I'll do it over and over again, Ya Aba Abdullah. They were ready. How ready are we for qital? We're ready for salah. We're ready for majalis. But push comes to shove. They had an imam they were ready to lose their life for. How about if we have an imam one day, are we ready to lose their life? When I sometimes see some of the followers of Ahlul Bayt who have lost their lives in different parts of the world, you have to respect the fact that this person went on a battlefield to protect Muhammad and Al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi alayhim and their heritage. He said to them, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالْقِتَالِ And then he turned around. The authority of the right wing, Zuhair ibn al -Qain. You know, when you make a formation for a sports team, what do you do? You have to bring the main personalities. These are the pillars of Hussein bin Ali's army at 6 a.m. Karbala, 61 A.H. Ashura. Right wing. Subhanallah, the same terms we use for sports today. On the right wing, Zuhair ibn al -Qain, Which always makes me doubt the story that Zuhair ibn al -Qain was against Imam al Hussein and then changed on their journey back. You know, they say they met on the way back from Hajj and Imam al Hussein asked for Zuhair. How could someone turn from being an enemy of Imam al Hussein to suddenly being in charge of the right wing of the army of Imam al Hussein? Imam al Hussein, right wing, Zuhair ibn al Qayn. Left wing, who? Habib ibn Mawar. Left wing. Center, he is the captain. He takes the center. Standard bearer with the alam, his brother Abbas bin Ali. And he comes forward with these soldiers with him. The opposition soldiers, 30,000. But do you know the beauty of that lesson? Is that, wallah, when you have a Zuhair and you have a Habib, it doesn't matter how many are in front of you. Because the quantity is not like the quality of what he has. That's number one. Number two, do you know the beauty of him having 72 or 77 or 82, whatever number it is? Is that in life, having a small number may be something great for you. Because Hussein bin Ali ended this life with only having 70 odd loyal people. Sometimes there are people who think if they have a small number, they're not successful. I've seen even Maulanas who say, that when they come to me and say, how do I get a big crowd? I only had 36 people in my crowd. I say, MashaAllah, you had half of Hussein bin Ali. You've done well. You've done well. Imam al Hussein showed us not about the sizes, but rather about the quality of the individuals. His side, 72, 77, 82. Umar bin Sa'ad, 30,000. On the right side, Amr bin Hajjaj al Zabidi. On the left side, Shimr bin Dil Joshan. In charge of the foot soldiers, Shibit bin Rabi. In charge of the cavaliers, Uzra bin Qais. In charge of the banner, Doraid. Which of these names are names of respect? Which of them? Even some of them are the backstabbers of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, who ended up backstabbing, having told Imam al Hussein to come towards Kufa. Notice that the moment this arrogant army comes towards Imam al Hussein's army, you know what Imam al Hussein's done? He's put fire around his tent so that they can only attack from one angle. So Imam al Hussein has lit a fire around his tent. Shimr bin Dil Joshan, frustrated by the fire that's been lit, calls out, Hussein, are you rushing to the fire before the fire of the day of judgment? The insult of Shimr bin Dil Joshan, that you're preparing a fire. So that you could be ready for Qiyamah's fire that awaits you? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam replies. How does he reply? Imam turns around and he says, Is that Shimr bin the Joshan? They say to him, Yes. He said, O oh, son of the goat herder. Mufid narrates this in the Irshad. O oh, son of the goat herder. Someone might turn around and say, Imam al Hussein, why would you reply like that? For what reason? That is not the best akhlaq. Number one, when it's haq vi batan, then the language has to be strong. His father, Amir al-Mu'mineen as well, when there was haq vi batan, there was no such thing as I want to be polite. No, he is arrogant towards me, then I will stand up against him. O son of the 
goat herder. He doesn't say, oh, son of the Joshan. Why son of the goat herder? In the Mustadrak of Safina al Bihar, there's a narration about Shimr's birth. Shimr's mom had gone from one desert to another, one day on a journey. She became really thirsty. She had no water left. So she found a place where there was a man who had water. That man said to her, I will not give you the water unless you fulfill my desires. She fulfilled his desires. Shimmer was born from that adulterous relationship. Imam wanted to remind him of his background. Being a goat herder is not an insult, but it relates to a story your mother was involved in as well. That lady had given birth to Shimmer bin Dil Joshan through a zina relationship with a random stranger because she was thirsty. He said to her, I said to him at that moment, O oh son of the goat herder, you are more worthy of the punishment than I am. Muslim bin Awsaja at this moment picks up his bow and arrow because he cannot take the insult hurled to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. As a Muslim is about to strike, Imam says, stop. <clears throat> Muslim stops. I do not like that we start war. This is the major principle of Hussein bin Ali. Hussein bin Ali had a chance to begin battle at Karbala a week before this moment. When Hur bin Yazid Riyahi's army was small in number, Zuhair ibn al qain told Imam al Hussein in Karbala a week before Ashura day, Mawla, he's got a small number. It's our only chance now we could finish them all before he gets the bigger number of soldiers to come. Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi did not have more than a few thousand. Zuhair ibn al qain told Imam al Hussein a week before, let's go and finish them now. On the one hand, Imam al Hussein knows what Hur is and what Hur will happen to later. On the other hand, Imam al Hussein, like his father, Imam Ali, like his grandfather, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, never wanted to be the ones who begin war. Never. That is not us, the followers of Ahl al Bayt. We are not a group who look for war or look to begin war. He looked at Muslim and Awsajah. Muslim was innocent. Muslim could not take that Shimmer had told Imam al Hussein, MashaAllah, you're preparing yourself for Jahannam. Muslim was about Imam said, No. I hate that we are the ones who begin the war. We defend ourselves, yes. But it shouldn't be part of our character to look for bloodshed. Shouldn't be part of our character that we look for war. Rather, he looked at Muslim. He raised his hands in the sky in front of the whole army of Umar bin Sa'ad. And he recites one of the most beautiful du'as I have ever heard from any Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. There are people here in this hall who may be going through difficult times, personal times which are difficult. You may be going through trials in your life. There is no man who ever faced a trial in one day like Hussein bin Ali. And yet look at his words at around 6.30 a.m. on Ashura day. Oh Allah, you are my trust in every calamity. And you are my hope in every difficulty. <clears throat> Anyone watching this, wherever you are, I ask you that whenever you're going through a hard time, read the dua of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on Ashura day. O oh Allah, you are my trust in every calamity, and you are my hope in every difficulty, and you are for me in every matter that falls upon me a trust and a preparer. How many a difficulty in which the kernel of the heart becomes weakened? Opportunities become scarce. Our friends let us down. Our enemies mock us. Have I complained to you, O oh Allah, and left to you? Subhanallah, we think Ahl al-Bayt are robots. Wallah, Ahl al-Bayt saw more than what we saw. And he says clearly that how many difficulties the kernel of the heart is weakened. Opportunities become scarce. 
friends let you down enemies mock you they laugh at you but you allah i complain to you and i left these to you for i don't desire anyone except you oh allah wallah this is like a love letter from a lover to his beloved yes i only desire you and no one but you then he says to him at that moment for you O oh allah are the one who pushes all these difficulties away and relieves me of them you are the master of every blessing and the final hope for every wish he said this in the morning of ashura it became one of the greatest duas recited by any imam it's not as long as the other ad'iyah we recite but the meaning of it was a man who faced the biggest difficulty in his life and said that while I have you, I can face whatever difficulties in front of me. Wallah, it's a metaphor for anyone's life that you may see thousands in front of you who are about to attack you, mock you, gossip about you, rip you, hurt you. But while I have what? You are my trust in every calamity and you are my hope in every difficulty. While I have you, then I will come out victorious on that day. <clears throat> but when he uttered those lines as well, it's as if he was uttering them knowing that he wanted those lines not just to reach them, but to also reach the ladies in his tent as well. Why? Because it's as if he was saying that I want you ladies to have the same trust in Allah with the calamities that you're going to see in the same way I have that trust in Allah. And especially for him, his soft spot, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, no doubt. Because for him, he had seen Zainab a night before Ashura. What did Sayyidah Zainab do that night before Ashura? She literally ripped her clothes and hit herself, knowing what's going to happen. It's as if Imam, when he raised his hands, wanted Zainab to hear. That Zainab, look at me. Look what the world has done to me and you. Now all we have is Allah. We have hope in Allah, trust in Allah. You're going to have to have this trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with what you're about to see. I say to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, you are an Imam, you're ma'soom, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have that patience to be able to overcome whatever is in front of you. Zainab alayhi salam no doubt has her level of isma. But what Zainab saw after you left this world was the most difficult that anyone could see. And while we are here next to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, what more beautiful than to remember his daughter Zainab alayhi salam, yes? And to remember that musibah because while Hussein was speaking on the morning of Ashura, Zainab's heart was being ripped apart in the tents on Karbala's earth. Her heart was being ripped apart when she saw Aba Abdullah lonely on the plains of Karbala. I ask you if her heart was ripped apart when she saw him giving this sermon, then how was her heart when she saw Imam al Hussein alone on the plains of Karbala? How was her heart when she saw him fall off his horse on the afternoon of the 10th of Muharram? How was her heart when she saw them kick the head of Imam al Hussein? How was her heart when she heard Imam al Hussein call out, Are there any helpers to help us? We say, Labbaika, Ya Hussein. How was her heart when she saw the arrows all over the chest of the Imam, how was her heart when she saw Sinan bin Anas and Shimr bin Dil Joshan approach the body of Abu Abdullah? How was her heart when she saw the head of Imam al Hussein raised by Shimr for all of them to see? But how was her heart when she saw the horses trampled on the body of Abu? 
عبد الله وان امام وان شي سوء امام زين العابدين she asked him I hear bones breaking tell me what they are the imam turned to her that night he said to her auntie auntie those are the bones of my father imam al hussein that are being crushed on the earth of Karbala إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون يا الله we raise our hands on this the night of the first of Muharram we pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad يا الله raise us with the Imam of our time Imam صاحب العصر والزمان allow us to be amongst his companions يا الله the originators of this majlis spiritual journeys as well as the Khuy Institute يا الله bless them arhumin and allow them to be of those who receive the shafa'ah of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Surah Al Fatiha, but before it, wherever you may be, the loudest of your salawat.